Welcome, I'm John Caldera, president of the Independence Institute and your devil's advocate, the national popular vote, which was so gently shoved down our throats, Mr. Trimpa, uh, will be on the ballot next year. So we're going to have a conversation about it. Actually, a good friend of mine, Ted Trimpa, who destroyed our state single-handedly. Um, again, it's good to be here. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> appreciate the greeting. You're welcome. <laughs> Don Wilson, who has been putting together an effort against the national popular vote, a mayor of, of Monument. Yes, thanks for having me. Nice haircut. Thank you. Yeah. I think everyone will be wearing it soon enough. Ted's next. All right. I tell you what, before we... <laughs> Ted's next. <laughs> Before we get before we get into the the details of the polis, the politics of what happened in Colorado, what might happen in Colorado, give me the the, the reason why you've and you've always been a supporter of the national popular vote. Yeah. You and I have gone round about this a lot of times. Um, for those who don't know, we have an electoral system. Colorado has nine electoral votes, and when we vote for president, those nine votes. Uh, go to those electors. Nobody else controls those electors except us. Tell me what the national popular vote is, giving you the background and why it's such a dandy idea. National popular vote ensures that every vote in every state counts every time for the national popular vote for president and that each time we vote for president, that's how we determine who's president. Because how the system operates today, it, it ignores three quarters of the states. And how you become a battleground state, there's, it's, there's no magic formula. It's just on a, whether or not those states are competitive. Um, and so the underlying problem is the winner-take-all rule. It's not the Electoral College. And the winner-take-all rule is not in the Constitution. It wasn't discussed at the Constitutional Convention, was not in the Federalist Papers, actually didn't appear until the third president, mostly until the second and third presidential election, and then became the prominent rule uh, by the mid-1850s, um, is biasing how we do policy in this country. Now, if you think about Medicare Part D, which I'm sure you loved, you know, that was passed by a Republican Congress and a Republican president because they needed Florida. We have to stop that kind of policy skewing through electing the president. You mentioned that the winner take all, and that's the, the case here in, in, in Colorado. Um, 48 states. 48 states. So, but there's two states that do it differently, which I believe are Kansas and Maine. I'm trying to remember. Uh, Nebraska, Nebraska and Maine. All right, close. Kansas, Nebraska. Hey, hey, I'm it's, a Kansas. It's, it's like when you tell somebody from Jersey, New York, New Jersey, it's the same. No, it's not. Um, you know, they do, uh, Kansas, Nebraska, does a proportional uh, system, I believe. It's congressional district. Congressional district. Okay, by congressional district. Right. Um, uh, that's not what happened here. Before we get into the, what happened here. So I understand the concept here, and, and Ted's right that there are these states that become the battleground states and a whole presidential election swings on who can win you know and this this time it'll, it'll be michigan ohio pennsylvania maybe wisconsin some think colorado i think they're dreaming but some think that and so you know there's no reason to go to california we know how they're going to vote for president they just don't count so what's wrong with the idea of letting every vote count well, the problem with it is it doesn't actually happen. You're still going to have your focus on those main areas. Um, the idea that national popular vote is going to change that isn't. And I'll borrow Trent's comment. You can't take the politics out of politics. You're still going to have that focus on certain areas, major populations, and you're still going to have a lot of people left out. Why would you travel to a certain area for their votes if you know the majority is going to vote a certain way. And also it takes away the state's independence. And the one thing that the Electoral College, or one of the things that the Electoral College does for us is instead of having a mass area of, of focus, a uh, majority, a strong majority in, in kind of one area, you have majorities in individual states. Each state has their own majority. What you're doing I think is you're taking the um, winner-take-all issue and making it a larger winner-take-all issue. Well, and it, and it is. If, and I, I want to get into the, how it would actually work. Um, you know, the idea that um, that we're the United States of America. We're not the United Cities of America. We're not the United Metropolitan Areas of America. We can argue whether the founders wanted a winner-take-all electoral system, but there's no doubt that the founders wanted states and that there was going to be a parity between the states and the federal government. 
um, you know, in the same way that we have senators from states for balance that have nothing to do with population, um, that, that this is a state issue. And you might say you're empowering people to vote, but aren't you disempowering a state? No. And uh, let's break out the issues as you present them. First of all, one, the argument around the big cities, big states. If the facts were as you state them, then yeah, that would be an argument. But it's not true. You know, the top 10 cities only represent 8% of the population. The top 50 cities only represent 15% of the population. One-sixth of America lives in rural areas. One-sixth of America lives in urban areas. And the rest is everything in between. And what's interesting, the one-sixth in urban areas vote almost 60-40 Democrat. And those one-sixth that live in rural areas vote 60-40 Republican. And then those in the middle usually span a five-point, you know, margin. And so to say that a big state or big cities are going to control the election, it just in terms of the arithmetic isn't possible. But when it comes to the arithmetic, I mean, you're talking about the numbers, and I understand what you're saying. That makes sense. It don't, I don't think it works like that. We just had uh, an election in 2006 where all the numbers said this is going to happen this way, and it didn't. We continue to see, OK, yes, these numbers might make sense, but when, when they go out and campaign, they're still going to be looking for that 60. They're not going to be looking for that 40%. They want to get as many of those 60% as possible. Why don't we slide into the politics of this, and then we're going to, all the, all the arguments I think will fall into place. It was interesting that the international, or the, the state compact for the national popular vote is a pretty clever mechanism. And the idea is, tell me if I've got this right, that every state is able to dictate how they're going to run their, their presidential campaign. And therefore, if you get enough states to say, hey, whatever the popular vote is nationwide, we're going we're gonna to dictate that our electors vote for that person. Um, so you're looking to get, I'm trying to remember, you're at how many electoral votes? Today? Today. We're at 196. And, and we need 270 for the compact to be effective. And it only goes into effect once you hit 270 or more. Okay. Um, let's talk about how this passed in Colorado. Um, there's never been a state where there wasn't even a token Republican that, that supported this idea. That's uh, not true. We'll get really? to that. Okay. Yeah. But there wasn't a Republican who voted for this um, in the Colorado legislature. So it was a completely Democratic uh, proposal, voted on for Democrats, signed by a Democratic governor. Um, this is not a bipartisan issue, at least in this state. Um, in this state, I will agree, it turned out to be a partisan issue. But what I find fascinating is, is that Republicans want to keep the winner-take-all rule today. And it's pretty obvious that this state's going to go Democratic, which means all those Republican votes mean nothing, zero, nada. And you want to keep a system that means that your vote doesn't mean anything. I find that somewhat ironic. Um, I find it somewhat principled, but we can talk about that. And but, also, I don't see Colorado but, being monolithic and progressive forever. Oh, I agree with that. So in terms of it being partisan, this was the first state that national popular vote was run in in 2006. That's right after the 2004 election. So it was charged in a partisan way. The late Ken Gordon, you know, who was a prominent liberal, who was the majority leader of the Senate at the time, was the sponsor. So you know, out of the gate for us, the die in Colorado was kind of set. But what this ignores is we still have substantial Republican support for this in terms of the Republican electorate. We've had Republican chambers across the country pass this. Imagine this, Oklahoma. The Oklahoma Senate passed it. I don't Oklahoma live in Oklahoma. Is not, I want to talk about Colorado. not a bastion of How Democratic is it politics. You weren't able to get even, even someone as liberal as Kevin Priola to vote for this in, <laughs> in, in, the, in the legislature. You weren't able to get any Republican to vote for this. How? Well, again, because in Colorado, how it started out, it was, you know, it's difficult to back that train up. Um, you know, I will still say we have very conservative Republican support, former chair of ALEC, you know, the American Legislative Exchange Committee, which is not some liberal bastion. Not headquartered um, in Colorado and not a Colorado organization. True. But, you know, I wouldn't say that conservatives in Oklahoma are that much different than conservatives in Colorado or conservatives in Texas. And so Good. we need to be thinking about I'm overall. Gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna remember that quote because yeah. <laughs> I think there's a, there's a big difference. All right, you, you can, you can and, and, and put yeah. lipstick on this, but let's just be honest. In Colorado, this thing uh, was shoved down the throats of oh, now the Republicans. That, okay, that is ridiculous. Because Not ridiculous, it was. We, 
we introduced this bill in January. The last time I checked, Republicans can read. The last time I checked, Republican leadership understands how the process works. Hearings were delayed in order to make sure that people could testify. Hearings were held longer to make sure that people could testify. So anyone who says that this was shoved down their throats, I mean, if you want to talk about shoved down their throats, let's recall back when the Republicans controlled the state Senate, actually all of the legislature, they tried to do redistricting in 2003 after the lines were already drawn. Now that is ballsy. Getting back to this, though, <laughs> there was, I don't recall the Democrats running in 2018 with this as a front runner issue. I don't remember the governor saying this is a major issue. I don't remember state senators saying this is an issue. Um, uh, this, this was not up there. You can argue oil and gas. You can argue all sorts of issues. You can argue gun control. This one was not a burning issue until the beginning of the session. Fair enough? Um, no, because we had been talking to legislators ever since we ran this back in, what, 2006. So, I mean, this issue has always been around. It's just a question of when is the right political environment here so we can pass it, and do we have a governor that will sign it? It wasn't in front of the voters. And then come you and Rose Puglisi, who is a Mesa County commissioner, mm -hmm. dusting off something that hasn't been used in nearly 100 years, pulling this thing up and bringing it to a citizen's referendum. First of all, why? And then secondly, how? This was, <clears throat> first of all, the why. This was a topic that was very passionate in our communities. We were both approached by our constituents um, asking, you know, why? What can we do? I have what I consider great legislators in my area, and I knew that they got to a point where their hands were tied. They were, there was nothing they could do. Um, me and Rose talked about pulling this idea off the dusty shelf and felt we had enough support to go after it. And certainly you did. You needed to raise about 120,000 signatures. How many signatures did you bring in to put this thing on the ballot? With our response from the Secretary of State with certification, over 228,000. Wow. All right. And I will agree with Ted on this. It's not a partisan issue. We had signatures from all groups, and 90% of our feedback uh, came individually. It didn't come from, hey, I'm a Republican and I'm against this, I'm a Democrat. We did have some people mention it. I had a uh, 2016 uh, Bernie delegate say, no, this is wrong. It's, it doesn't work. What, it's, what it claims to do doesn't actually work. There was, there was a couple missteps, uh, politically speaking, I think, on your side. One, there wasn't the safety clause on the bottom right. of this, which, by the way, thank you. Uh, I wish all bills had this. You know, and for those who don't know, if the safety clause is at the bottom of a bill, you can't bring it up for a citizen's referendum, which right. is why for the last 97 years we really haven't seen this. So things like naming our, our uh, state fish is, is done for the immediate health and safety of Colorado, and you can't put it on right. as a referendum. So thank you for doing that. Strategically, that seemed to have been a mistake. And the other mistake was the governor signed it like this, giving this guy an extra you know, five, six weeks to collect double the amount of signatures he, he needed. Um, but what I found so fascinating is I've heard the governor say that he's really proud that Colorado will be voting on this issue. We're the first state to, to do this, and what an exciting thing so that everybody can weigh in on this. I'm thinking, well, wait, wait a second, dude. Why didn't you guys put this up for a referendum to begin with? Why did you sign the bill? If it's such a great idea that it goes to the people, why didn't you guys put it up okay, as a referendum? So Article 1, Section 2 of the Constitution is very clear that the state legislatures pick or decide the method of awarding their electors, and they have exclusive and plenary authority to do that. Um, and that is an 1898 Supreme Court case, and then Bush v. Gore affirmed it. Exclusive came from the 1898 case, plenary came from Bush v. Gore. In terms of the safety clause versus referendum, our Senate sponsor, Mike Foote, felt very strongly about with an issue like this that the referendum clause should, should be on. You know, ideally for me as a political strategist, I would rather not because then we wouldn't be having this debate. Uh, but we're, we are where we are. Um, and we're confident that every vote in every state and will count in every presidential election according to the national popular vote. In terms of Jared, I, the one thing I'll say about Jared, and we've talked about this, I said, you know, Jared is going to be a surprise to a lot of people. He's not going to be this left swinging, always in one box type of governor because he truly is kind of a disruptor. He's willing to do things a little bit differently. And he also realizes that he's governor of all of Colorado. 
And so for him to stand up and be, you know, uh, he can say how he thinks people should vote, but in terms of how he's talking about it, I don't blame him. You know, I mean, he's governor for me, and he's also governor for the mayor. Yeah, but I, you're not answering the question. Let me try it again. If it's such a nice thing, and we're celebrating that these guys put it on the ballot, why didn't you guys who pushed it put it on the ballot to begin with, saving you the trouble and expense of all okay, that? Okay, I will answer it again. Article 1, Section 2 of the Constitution says state legislatures. Article 4 of the state constitution declares that the people are also the legislature. The legislature has the authority to put any, any statutory change on the ballot and any constitutional change on the ballot. Are you telling me you guys did not have the authority? to put, make this a popular vote, no, but these guys did? Following what the U.S. Constitution says, but I also find it somewhat ironic that we hear from people of your ilk, John, about this being a democratic republic, a democratic republic, that we elect people in order to make decisions. <laughs> then all of a sudden, when you don't like the decisions that are being made, it's like, oh, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, hide, let's, let's do a direct democracy. This, this, this silliness that you couldn't have put it on the ballot. You could have put it on the ballot. I'm asking, why didn't you put it on the ballot? They want to make sure it passes. All right. It's not on the ballot anywhere. And, you know, I do understand the process and they have the right. We elect them to make the decisions. But I think there's also a point on certain decisions where it's a decision big enough that you need to take it to your constituents. Do you understand what a can of worms you just opened up here? In that, uh, my sense is this is going to become a national issue because, and tell me if, I'm, if, if you feel differently on this, if this gets reversed by the people of Colorado after only Democrats voted for it in the legislature, it will have, how do you lawyers put it, a chilling effect on this <laughs> idea. Uh, but it could really slam the door on the national popular vote nationally. Um, so while you and I are thinking about this in Colorado eyes, you know, the guys with money, uh, they might be coming in uh, full bore on this. We believe they are. Um, we're expecting that and we've already seen the national effect we've had calls from Oregon California um, Chicago we had a call from Co Chicago asking us you know what are you guys doing how are you guys handling this so we're already seeing the national side of it hopefully we can engage that to help us well John this yeah. is bound don't, to be don't hold, don't hold your breath <laughs> this is bound to be a national issue because it's about the national popular vote but we are confident and we know we have a path to 270 whether this passes or not. But we're confident that we're going to win because we have um, a very substantial majority of Democrats. We have a good number of unaffiliated and we actually have a respectable number of Republicans who believe that every vote in every state should count toward electing the president by a national popular vote. Hey, ask about the, the, oh, go ahead. I'm curious about how, and, and it's one thing I don't understand about this, every vote counts but yet we see um, things going on like we have, what, 25 states right now trying to keep an individual candidate off their ballot. So how is my vote oh, so be more specific. trying to pass legislation? Because the national popular vote allows the states to stay intact as far as making their own voting election, uh, legislation. How they, do their, how they do their vote, how they right. do their votes, how they collect the votes, how they count the votes. And, and their ballots. So correct me if I'm wrong, but we can have different candidates on different ballots in different states, right? No, the compact, and, and it's, as, as it is today, it's called, a sh I think, short presidential ballot. The states have to use a short presidential ballot, and that's what's been happening for a number of years. I mean, this is an argument that Professor Hardaway from DU keeps trying to dig up, and it has something to do with Alabama back in the 60s, and it's not relevant today. And what's also important, and I think it would be important for people like John, that the states retain, just like they have today, the right um, and authority to run their elections according to their law, and federal law just provides sideboards um, on how you run that election. Let me tee off that one specifically. You're right, we do have the uh, right to be able to run our elections. So we have 50, actually 51 different elections with 51 different election judges who oversee that, namely the Secretary of State in every state. Mechanically, I'm really concerned that if this goes forward, that if we have a problem with a vote count someplace else, uh, uh, the state of Chicago, because it will be a state soon, uh, when the state of Chicago 
um, decides to turn in twice as many votes for, for uh, whoever's running, Michelle Obama, because uh, uh, she'll run. Uh, so when Michelle runs, um, then you know, every dead person in daily, uh, the daily system brings out, we cannot challenge that. There's no way for us to challenge that. Only, only Illinois can do that. And so while we can only look at our votes here, we're going to build a race for people, uh, particularly a Secretary of State who wants to do what Texas did back in 1960. We don't know. We have no control over that. There is not one, there is not one uh, election. There are all these other elections. Under your proposal, we have a date certain. And when a Secretary of State decides a winner of a state and that count by those numbers, that officially gets put in. You see no, no chance that for is, a hanky-panky there? No, that, that is federal law in terms of the date certain that the count has to be done. That is true. But if you're so concerned about this, um, then you should be even more concerned because there are fewer states that are involved today. And so the, if, if it were to happen in one of these states, then you would have a real problem because you don't have all the other states to add into a vote total. Because statistically, when you add in all 50 states in the District of Columbia, the likelihood of an extra 2,000 votes somewhere, an extra 5,000 votes somewhere, heck, an extra you know, 100,000 votes somewhere um, isn't going to matter because you're going to have such a larger pool of votes that are being counted. So again, if you're worried about that kind of problem, you should be more worried about it under the system this, today. This was a silliness I heard on the mail-in ballot too, which is, yeah, there might be more you know, loose ballots floating around in people's trash cans, but there's going to be so many more people coming in It'll take care of any any sort of um, voter fraud that goes on. Same logic? Um, no. It, on the voter fraud issue, I, I can just say this: if only we had enough time, you know, and enough planning in order to do it. it th this is a red herring issue, and it's been a red herring issue for a very long time. And if you're concerned about voter fraud, then you should be more concerned about the current system because there are fewer states involved. And if there was going to be some grand conspiracy, which again is highly, highly, highly unlikely, but if there is going to be one, it would be a lot easier to execute using six states than 50. I'm not talking about a grand conspiracy of 50 states. I'm talking about a grand conspiracy of one secretary of state who wants to run that election in a very uh, um, not forthright way. And there's no undoing that. There's no challenge in Colorado to force Chicago and Illinois or whatever state to, to check their numbers. First off, again. Fair enough. I mean, we, don't, we have no legal ability to force another state into a recount. Th that is true because okay. it is based, it's based upon whatever the state law is. Okay. Um, we, we're going to have a year and what? Uh, two months or something yeah, yeah. To, 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 to argue this one. It's also going to happen in the, in the shadow of a presidential election. And let's be clear, this will have nothing to do with the next election. Even, even if it wasn't pulled off because of the referendum, it no, still wouldn't have to It's not possible. Um, uh, but it also, there's a senatorial election. There'll be a state house, a state senate. Um, this has a potential of setting a tone for that. So I'm curious. Have you done any polling on this? My gut feeling tells me that people don't like the idea of the national popular vote in Colorado, but not by a wildly large margin. You know, the polling we've done, um, we did polling and it came out very, very even. Um, when we added a piece of, uh, a little educational piece on the Electoral College, it actually went in our favor and we were very happy with the way that looked. Um, is that, a, is that and, a pleasant way of saying push poll? Yes. yes. <laughs> All right, so you did a push poll, and it went your way. I have a feeling the guys who can actually afford good push polls would have, have, a, have a similar thing. How are you going to convince I'm, people to, to vote no on this issue? Well, I think the biggest issue we're seeing is people not understanding the Electoral College and how it works and, and just a complete lack of understanding there. And we're going to be pursuing that area. Pursuing people in Colorado voted against Trump. Mm -hmm they're likely going to vote against Trump again. Although there's, I'm not certain about that, but I, I'm, you know, I, I think that's going to be the case. And the reason Trump is in office is the Electoral College. So you're going to say, yeah, this, this gave you this awful president that you hate so much, but please vote for the system that put him in there? That's a tough sell. It is a tough sell, but it's got the history behind it to, 
to counteract that. I mean, we're talking about what five times in 200 over 200 years that the popular vote has not matched the electoral college. And, and but recently, you, recently, but, but if you take the landslide elections, so those are presidential elections that were won by eight points or more and you then take those elections, so basically close elections, one in seven are wrong way elections. And there were an additional, I think, five or seven presidential elections, three of which would have gone the wrong way, but for margins of less than 2,000 votes in some states. So to, for someone to, to put out, with all due respect, the mayor, um, that it's not a problem, it is a big problem, and it's going to get worse given how polarized the country is and how close the numbers are um, nationally with the, with the national popular vote. Have you done polling? What, do you, what does your side look at it here our, in Colorado? Our side is showing very strong support with Democrats. Our side is showing very strong support with unaffiliated and a respectable number uh, with What's Republicans because, because people believe that every vote should count in every state in every presidential election. Whoever wins the national popular vote should be president. And every vote does count in every state to elect those electors who represent us in a Republican form of government. But thanks to winner take all, though, those on the no side, those on the losing side, quick, those votes don't, they don't add up to anything. 30 seconds left. Why not then do what Nebraska does and do it by district or do a proportional? Then what you're going to have is on congressional district, you're going to have battleground congressional districts rather than battleground states. It's that simple. And on proportional, one, there are a lot of problems with it in terms of how do you divide up the electors based on that. And the second is all the states would have to do it at the same time in order for it to work. And I'd like to see you People want to get information on the national popular vote. Where do they go, Ted? They go to mpv.com. npv.com. Sounds like a venereal um, disease. National, it's nationalpopularvote.com, too. Where do they go? Protect Colorado's vote. Protectcoloradosvote.com? Yep. Gentlemen, thank you. This is always fun. It's going to be a fun year. We'll see you next week. <laughs>